In this video, we introduce the likelihood ratio. This is just a way of simplifying some of our binary hypothesis testing. So remember that in that framework, we had two hypotheses, H0 and H1, those partitioned some underlying sample space, and we observed Y, whose values were drawn either in a discrete way, so we either had a conditional PMF given H0 for Y, under H0, and one for H1 if H1 occurs. In the continuous case, same thing, we have F of Y given H0 for H0, and F of Y given H1 for H1. Okay, we also needed a decision rule dy that outputs 0 or 1 based only on the observation y. So what we're going to do now is just revisit the ML and MAP rules through the perspective of the likelihood ratio. Okay, we're going to call this Ly, and this Ly is just P of y given h1 divided by P of y given h0 in the discrete case, and F of y given h1 divided by F of y h0 in the continuous case. So all we're doing is taking a ratio of these conditional probability models, okay? And we're going to use this to specify the ML and MAP rules. And the only reason that we do this is that in many cases, it allows us to really simplify the decision rule and get a more general framework. So we'll see some examples of that in a little bit. So the maximum likelihood in this case is going to just be the following. So once you've computed your likelihood ratio, you're going to say 1 if it's greater than or equal to 1, 0 if it's less than 1. We can also talk about the log likelihood ratio. That's sometimes easier. And that one, we're going to do the same thing we're going to compare it to zero though, because if you take log of both sides, you'll get log of one, which is just zero. Remember, in the discrete case, the likelihood ratio is just P of Y given H1 divided by P of Y given H0. In the continuous case, it's the PDFs, F of Y given H1 divided by F of Y given H0. Okay, so this log of Ly is called the log likelihood ratio. And the reason we sometimes use this is just the same reason we use the likelihood ratio. It helps simplify things further. For the map rule, we have to think about this just a little bit. In the map rule, we were weighting each of our um, probability models by the hypothesis probabilities. In order to use them with the likelihood ratio, we're going to have to keep those hypothesis probabilities on the other side of the likelihood ratio. So it's going to serve like a threshold. So we're going to compare it to P of H0 divided by P of H1. And if we're greater than that or equal, we'll say 1. Otherwise, we'll say 0. OK, and if you just take the log of both sides, that's how you'd use the log likelihood ratio. OK, if you expand this out, you can convince yourself that What's happening is if I take the likelihood ratio and multiply both sides of that by P of Y given H0, you'll see that goes to the P of H0. And if you multiply both sides by P of H1, you'll see that P of Y given H1 gets P of H1. So that makes sense. Okay, so we'll just write this out. This is basically the map rule in the discrete case, okay? And that's the same as just dividing things on either side, as I just said, okay? So this is exactly why that happens. OK, let's work a couple of examples. So in this example, we're going to say that under H0, Y is binomial N, P0. And under H1, Y is binomial N, P1. Let's write the likelihood ratio in this case. So we're going to have two different binomial PMFs with a different parameter P0 or P1. So we're going to see n choose y, that's going to be p1 to the y, 1 minus p1 to the n minus y, dividing by n choose y, p0 to the y, 1 minus p0 to the n minus y. Okay, simplifying, so putting things together, the n choose y's cancel out, and I get this, um, these parameters raised to the y times 1 minus p1 to the n, 1 minus p0 to the n. Okay, so for the ML rule, I just take this particular uh, expression, and I just compare it to 1. Okay, so I'm just going to write that out. I'm going to plug everything in here, and I'm going to see what does it mean to compare that to uh, 1. Okay, so I just have this expression. If I plugged in those parameters, if I had numbers for them, 
I would plug them in, I would plug in y, and then I would just see if it's greater than or less than one, and then I would make my decision. So can we simplify this a bit further? It turns out we can. So if we use a log likelihood ratio, we can further simplify this, okay? So as a further simplification, we're just gonna take logs of both sides here. So we're gonna take log of this ratio, and what the log is gonna do is it's gonna take y out of this exponent here. So y is sitting in the exponent, and it's gonna move it down in front, right? So um, we're gonna get y times log of um, the base, p1 times one minus p0 over p0 times one minus p1, plus n times log one minus p1 over n one minus p0. So then the ML rule is just plugging that thing in, all right? So this is basically as simple as we're gonna get it in the general case. So I'm just gonna write that out, and that's going to be our ML rule. So the thing that I want to do with this, once I'm done writing it, is I want to convince you that this, even though it just seemed a little bit abstract, actually is a more powerful version of something that we did in a previous video, okay? So in a previous video, we actually looked at a special case of this example, and we worked it out using a table. And in that example, what we had was actually um, binomial random variables for y, but they had n is equal to 3, p0 is equal to 1 half, and p1 is equal to 3 fourths. If you go back, you'll see that that's true. So I'm going to plug in all those values. All right, so I'm just plugging in to the log likelihood ratio with those values. And I'm plugging in for a minus n log 1 minus p1 over 1 minus p0. And I'm getting y times log of 3 being compared to minus 3 log of 1 half. If you work all this out, you get y being compared to 1.89, which is basically saying when y is 2, 3, um, we're going to decide uh, for decision 1, okay? This turns out to be the same decision rule we arrived at using a table on that previous video. So here in one slide, we were able to get an expression that recovers that rule, but it recovers it for any binomial n, p0, and p1. Okay, whereas there we had a very specific case, we had to work out every entry in the table, and um, you can imagine that that quickly gets out of hand for larger values of n, whereas this would be completely fine. It's very simple to work out where that threshold is, even if n is very large. Another reason to use the likelihood ratio is in the continuous case. So for continuous examples, it can be very convenient. So for a continuous case, you can't imagine writing a table because there's infinitely many values. You know, So when n was 3, there were four values we could write a table. But for a continuum, we can't really write a table. So we're kind of stuck doing things like this. So let's say under h0, we have Gaussian with mean minus a variance sigma squared. And um, under h1, the mean is plus a. All right, let's draw what this looks like. And we're assuming a is greater than 0. So we're seeing a Gaussian kind of in red here under H1, so centered at plus A, and a Gaussian in blue here centered at minus A, and they have the same width because they have the same variance. So from the plot, what we can guess is that the ML rule is going to pick the higher likelihood, right? And that crossover point happens at Y equals zero. Okay, so we want to check that using the log likelihood ratio. So if you look at this plot, I want to decide h1 when f of y given h1 is larger than f of y given h0, so when red is higher than blue. So when y is greater than or equal to 0, I can see that red is higher than blue. And when y is less than 0, blue is higher than red. That's how I would decide if I just looked at this picture. Let's see if the log likelihood ratio bears that out. Okay, so I'm just plugging in the distribution of these two Gaussians. So the top one is going to be 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared. Um, e to the minus y minus the mean a, 2 sigma squared, and y minus a is squared. And on the bottom, I'm going to get the same thing, except now the mean is going to be um, minus a, so then I get plus a in that expression, and I'm going to cancel terms. Okay, so I'm just writing everything out here in this exponent, and I'm expanding out these squares, so I get y squared minus 2ay, plus a squared, and then y squared plus 2ay plus a squared, and everything is going to cancel out here except these ay terms, and that's what I'm left with. So basically, 
my um, log likelihood ratio gives me an ML rule that compares to zero, right? And what I'm going to find is all I'm comparing to zero is just two a y over sigma squared, and um, I don't really need the two a y over two a over sigma squared. Those are just a constant. So in fact, it's equivalent to just say y is greater than or equal to zero or y is less than zero, and that's the same thing I got from the plot, right? So it was okay for me to move two a and sigma squared over to the other side of this inequality because they're all positive. It doesn't change the sign of the inequality. So checking that y is greater than or equal to zero is the same as checking 2ay over sigma squared is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, what is the probability of error in this case? Well, we have this region where we're deciding h0 and this region where we're deciding h1. And I want to see what is the probability of error, All right? So what that's going to mean for us is um, I need to work out uh, exactly what is the area under the curve in each of these cases. So for the red curve, when it sits under um, the H0 region, that's going to be the problem. And for the blue curve, when it sits under the um, H1 region, the green part, that's going to be the problem. So the false alarm probability is the probability that I sit in the A1 region when it's actually H0. So that's this part here, that's A1. And that's gonna be the probability that Y is greater than or equal to zero, given that it's H0. So I'm just integrating the conditional PDF from zero to infinity. And this turns out to be the Q function um, of zero minus, minus A over sigma, which is this Q of A over sigma. Okay, so this is just something you can get using probability of an interval for a Gaussian because y is Gaussian. And the q function is just giving you the inverse, sorry, not the inverse, but the complementary CDF. So instead of less than value, it's greater than value. In this case, the value is zero. I'm going to do the same thing for misdetection. I'm just going to see when is y in the a0 region when it's h1, and the a0 region is just anything less than zero. So that's going to be when y is less than zero, uh, given h1. I'm going to integrate from minus infinity to zero, the conditional PDF for h1. And I'm going to get the phi function going from zero, subtracting the mean, divided by the standard deviation. That turns out to be, by symmetry, this q of a over sigma. OK, so putting all of this together, I um, weight these by their hypothesis probabilities, which I never really specified, and it turns out then in this special case, because the hypothesis probabilities add up to one, and they both have this q over a sigma, we didn't need um, the hypothesis probabilities to actually work out the probability of error. So that's just a very special feature of this Gaussian example. In general, you would need it. OK. So basically, this is giving us the total area where we're making an error is kind of governed by how big a is relative to the standard deviation. So if the mean is shifted very far out relative to the standard deviation, then you expect to make very few errors. Okay, to wrap up, what we're gonna do is just um, work out the map rule and the probability of error. So the map rule is gonna be exactly the same thing, except now we're going to have a threshold that depends on the relative hypothesis probabilities. And in this example, I'm not going to give you those values. We're just going to leave things a bit abstract. Okay, You could plug them in if you had them, but I'm just going to leave it as is. So you're comparing to the log of the ratio of probability of h0 over probability of h1. Okay, So that if it's greater than or equal to that value, you decide 1. If it's less than that value, you decide 0. Okay, um, And so if you plug in, um, those hypothesis probabilities, and you uh, plug in the log likelihood ratio that we derived before, that was 2a y over sigma squared, then you'll get this. You're basically just comparing y to sigma squared over 2a, because I moved it to the other side of the inequality, times log of probability of h0 over probability of h1. Okay, and let's, just to keep things simple, define beta to be sigma squared over 2a, log of probability of h0, 
over probability of h1. So beta is going to be our decision uh, threshold. So here it is. Basically, um, this is where we're deciding h1 to the right, and this is where we're deciding h0 to the left. So in this particular picture, you can imagine that the reason beta has gone to the right is that it's more likely h0 will happen. So I am favoring deciding h0. It could have easily been the other way. I can't really fit two pictures here. So if h1 were bigger than h0, in this picture, I would draw beta to the left. So this picture is just kind of a cartoon, but it implicitly is making that decision that p of h0 is bigger than h1. We don't have the value, so we don't really know, but in this picture, that's how we've decided. We're going to go back through and calculate the probability of error, um, which is the weighted probability of false alarm plus the weighted probability of misdetection. So we're going to do the same calculations we did before. Everything is basically going to look the same, except instead of the decision threshold at zero, we're going to have a decision threshold at beta, right? So this A1 region starts at beta and goes to infinity. So when y is greater than or equal to beta, but h0 has occurred, then I'm integrating from beta to infinity the conditional PDF when h0 occurs. That's going to be q of beta minus minus a over sigma, which is q of a plus beta over sigma. All right, for the probability of misdetection, I'm going to get the same kind of thing. So what's the probability that y lands in this a0 region, given that h1 occurred? That's going to be the probability that y is less than beta, given that h1 occurred. I'm going to integrate from minus infinity to beta, f of y given h1. That's going to be the phi function evaluated at beta minus the mean, which is a, divided by the standard deviation sigma. That's the same by symmetry of q of a minus beta over sigma. Okay, so before I didn't have this beta, or rather beta was equal to zero, I could just add these two terms up and worked out. But here it actually does depend on the specific values of the hypothesis probabilities. Okay, and if you had a specific value, you could just plug into all of these expressions and get a number.